Hi, my name is Ravindu Lianage and I'm originally from Sri Lanka. I'm a bachelor's student studying molecular bioinformatics at the University of Hovda here in Sweden. And today I'm sitting here with someone whose discovery just 30 years ago changed the course of molecular biology forever. Dr. Gary Rifkin. Hi. How are you doing? Great. Okay. Hearing that you have won the Nobel Prize must have been an unforgettable experience. Yes. Can you take me back to that moment? Yeah, it was a call at 3.58 in the morning from Thomas Perelman, who's the head of the Nobel Committee, mm -hmm. and saying, I have good news. <laughs> and I didn't expect it. It's, it, you know, um, you sort of know when your work is getting recognition, but you never know how you're doing in sort of what uh, how a Nobel Committee mm -hmm decides these things. And so getting a call and not getting a call is, is, is you can't expect it. And yeah. so I did not expect it. I want to talk more about um, the years that led to your discovery. Um, when you started doing the project, was your aim to identify the function of these molecules? No, no, no. It was a total surprise. Those of us who started to work on this little worm C. elegans were attracted to this worm as a, as a system for gene discovery, for anything you wanted to work on about how genes do things. And we were working on um, developmental biology. How does any uh, cell in our body know that you're a finger and, and not a brain? And sort of how does a cell determine what it's going to be and where it's going to do what it does? Mm -hmm. And so the way to try to understand that um, was was being done mostly in this little worm C. elegans, which is about a millimeter long. You can, you know, you can barely see it with your naked eye. Uh, and the reason it was being done on this worm was twofold. One is is that they're really easy to grow, and so it was, it's really economical and cheap is important mm -hmm. because if something is cheap and easy to grow, you don't need to write a lot of grants it, you know you're not spending all your money on cage costs or yeah. and so a little bit of money from in our case national institutes of health goes a long way and so the other reason that c elegans was uh incredibly useful is that its generation time is three days so if you're oh. asking for a genetic change you don't sit there wait for two generations. We can think of an experiment and get the results very, very quickly. It hasn't cost a lot of money. And if we're wrong, it doesn't matter because we can do the next experiment mm -hmm. and it's not six months of waiting. Yeah. And so it makes a huge difference. People talk about science as being hypothesis driven, mm -hmm. that that's what makes you, you know, that you have to have an idea of what you expect to see. In our case, we're happy with hypotheses that are wrong. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. As long as you have something that's making you do the science, the results will tell you what's right and what's wrong. And so that's a case of where the results actually, led, uh, even though it wasn't what you expected, it led to something completely different that is yeah. very revolutionary. It was a big surprise when the genes that we were working on turned out to be a 22 nucleotide RNA, mm -hmm. which was, you know, fivefold smaller than anything had been seen before. And for someone who doesn't have a background in molecular biology, how would you briefly explain microRNAs and um, why they're so important? You know, the first thing is is just that one would not have expected something to be 22 nucleotides long. Mm -hmm. uh, and then secondly, once we started pulling these things out by looking for uh, small RNAs that, that are sort of there in the cell, there are thousands of these things. And so it turns out that uh, humans have a few thousand, worms have a thousand, plants have a few thousand. And, and then the problem is to figure out what do they do? Mm -hmm. And um, one way is genetics to say, well, what happens if I knock it out? If, if somehow there's a mutation in it. But the first one, LIN4, which Victor Ambrose showed, that came out of genetics. Uh, my next question is a very important one. I heard that you gave away ice cream 
to your team when you heard that you won the Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, which flavor was it? <laughs> oh, I, which flavor? It was whatever they asked for. <laughs> so you have to understand the background of that. So. Um, uh, Diane Sacchetti is my lab administrator who's worked in my, with me in my lab, sort of, you know, helping me put grants together, uh, you know, all the things that you need to run an operation. And she's worked with me for almost 30 years. Her husband has the ice cream truck. Oh. And so we, I had served the frosty cones. It's called frosty. And, you know, it's the kind that it pulls up to a park and it plays the music. I don't know if they have it around <laughs> here, but it, it plays like a plink, plink, plink of music and you hear it because oh. there's nothing more fun than handing ice cream cones to people. They all look like they're four years old. Even if they're <laughs> 45 years old, they look four because everyone loves an ice cream cone. And so the day of the Nobel announcement, Diane asked Frank, her husband, can you bring the truck? And so, they came with a truck and I got to hop on and, and oh, serve it. And so all the people that I was serving, and there's a video on YouTube <laughs> or somewhere, and all the people I was serving were people who work in our building. So there's mm -hmm. 500 people who work, do molecular biology. And we were giving away the ice cream cones with jimmies. They're called putting the chocolate chips in Boston. They're called jimmies. I don't know why. <laughs> That's such a fun story. But the reason I brought it up was you seem to have this very fun and energetic demeanor about you, around you. But do you think keeping this sense of humor has helped you navigate the high stake world of science? Yeah, oh, definitely. I think uh, becoming a professor, you know, people who are joining a lab, they're, they're, they have some fear, like, can I do this? Am I gonna fail? And uh it, it's nice to put them at ease mm -hmm. and to be entertaining and 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 have fun with what we do so we do a lot of practical jokes in the lab uh there's a there's a lot of um playing around and i actually think that comedy is is a form of intelligence and i think if you uh, can sort of generate humor you're halfway to generating discoveries. You've mentioned about this when you were talking about the ears before your postgrad education, but um, you've talked about how the culture of your generation embraced this non-linear career paths. And something that I've noticed today, both within myself and also as part of the student body, is that a lot of students feel the constant pressure to have everything figured out and achieve success quickly, mm -hmm. just have your next step planned. What advice would you give to current students who are aspiring to uh, make discoveries in science? Yeah. Um, be wary of, of uh, vogues and trends. Um, there's a lot of pack or herd behavior in science. Science is not different than the broad society that most people move in a herd mm -hmm. and uh and you can easily try to get away from it would you say you're hopeful for the future of science do you think there's a lot more to be discovered oh yeah yeah it, it's not over <laughs> it's not over and it, you know like jennifer doudna who discovered crispr with emmanuel charpentier jennifer was a graduate student in our department. Yeah, I knew her when she was, you know, like, I hope I make it through graduate school. You know, she's it's first year graduate school. You don't know how well you're going to do, right? And then she's now the most famous scientist on earth. <laughs> so, you know, and she's the one who made CRISPR into what's a household name, right? Totally amazing to watch. Science is, it'll keep going. Thank you so much. Thank you.